So welcome everyone for joining. Thank you so much wherever you are across the world for tuning in. It's, I unfortunately can't see where everyone's from, but I would love to know if you want to put it in the chat where you've joined from today, whether that's in the UK or the US or somewhere else. Uh, this event is a collaboration between Flourishing Diversity, the Tapestry Institute and the Festival of Nature which is a festival that takes place in June across Bristol, Bath and online celebrating the natural world. And it's an absolute pleasure to have Dawn and Jerome here today as part of the festival to have a really, really interesting discussion. And how we're gonna run this session is Dawn and Jerome are gonna sort of talk throughout for about sort of 45 minutes, depending on how the conversation goes. If you have any questions, we'll probably leave them towards the end once you've hold, heard the whole discussion. Uh, if you have any burning questions, put them in the chat and I'll sort of decide whether it's worth bringing them up or making a note of them for the end. But thank you so much everyone for joining and uh, introducing Dawn and Jerome. I'm not sure who wants to start with a bit of an introduction. Oh, please Dawn, it'd be lovely to hear an introduction from you. Okay, hale to everyone from uh, Northwestern Nebraska in the United States. Uh, my name, my Choctaw name is Don Hill and my name to the American government is Don Adams. So I go by both. Uh, I'm Choctaw Indian. My people are from the, what is now the Southeastern part of the United States. If the lands that we lived on were on the Black Warrior and Tombigbee rivers that run through Mississippi and Alabama. And about not quite 200 years ago, we were relocated to what is now the state of Oklahoma. So that's where uh, much of my family still lives. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you, Dawn. Um, so my name is Jerome Lewis. I'm an associate professor of social anthropology at University College London. Um, I've been working since 1993 with Congo Basin hunter-gatherer peoples and in that time I've witnessed a very beautiful thriving and diverse forest slowly get eroded as uh, roads get cut into these beautiful areas that we spent months walking around uh, in the 1990s to the extent that now uh, Elephants are very rare and, and uh, the many gorillas and chimpanzees that also lived in those areas are becoming extremely scarce. And the quality of life of people as so-called development arrived in those areas deteriorated very steadily. And this has been a, a very sort of uh, upsetting experience for me, having known what, what it could be like in, in that place. And as a result, led me to be much more engaged in supporting indigenous peoples in particular but also other local communities to better represent their interests, their views to the incoming outsiders with their plans for development and modernity. Um, and, and this has been a long process and I've collaborated with many different groups of indigenous peoples and local communities over the years. But uh, in particular, uh, in 2019, uh, one of our collaborators, uh, uh, a Brazilian Ashen Inca man called Benki Piaco, asked to come to London to talk to people here to try and explain to them just how serious the problems were that he was witnessing in his place. And, in, uh, and, and we've, we followed through with that. And we had a conference we called the Flourishing Diversity Series. And in that conference, we had groups of people from the four corners of the world who came and set their agenda and told us what uh, they felt that uh, Western audiences needed to know about their ways of life and about their uh, struggles to sustain those ways of life. And this led to the creation of the Flourishing Diversity Initiative. And you can see on our website some of the work we do. But what we particularly try and do is to forefront Indigenous people's voices, because I think they offer a very important mirror to modern people around the world, to really look at us with fresh eyes, to think about the ways we do things that we take for granted as being correct and right, but actually are creating a terrible uh, uh, sort of conflagration of, of really worrying phenomenon. And uh, the heat that those who live in England are feeling today 
of course, is uh, you know rather premature. Normally, we'd be experiencing this at the sort of in in August or late July, but uh, here we are, and the situation is becoming increasingly uh, worrying. And it's really time that we paid much more attention to those people who do know how to care for the land, who do know how to live with the many other species on which we depend for our own flourishing. And, and as a result, we, we, in Flourishing Diversity, take a lot of time to try and bring Indigenous voices to those important discussions. And, uh, and it's really a great pleasure for me today to, to be able to spend some time talking together with you all, with Dawn, who has a really remarkable understanding of how human beings and the land that we dwell upon, the land that we walk upon, need to start to collaborate much more clearly uh, for that flourishing future to become a reality for our descendants. One of the things that has often struck me, and perhaps we can kick off with this, is that uh, even though indigenous people only represent about four or 5% of the human population, right now, today, they are caretakers or guardians or looking after about 80% of the remaining biodiversity on this planet. Dawn, can you help us understand why this should be so? Yeah. Uh, the short answer is it's because we understand sustainability as a natural law instead of as a human concept. Um, because if you are connected to the natural world, sustainability is simply written into it the same way gravity is. And uh, so, you know, if you have the experience of living on the earth as a person who walks around or climbs stairs or whatever, you understand that you can't jump off the top of a building and just waft gently to the ground. You know, you understand that, that gravity exists and that it has certain real uh, consequences if you violate that natural law. But um, for some reason, uh, at some point in history a long time ago, uh, the culture that we've come to call Western culture, which spread out across um, a great deal of, of Europe and, uh, and much of, of your sort of that, that hemisphere, um, quite a few hundred years ago, uh, somehow separated itself from contact with the natural world. Um, and uh, that contact has actually uh, become, that, that break in, in contact has actually been become something of, a, of an abyss or of a wall. Um, and it means that there are natural laws such as sustainability that are quite evident to anyone who's connected to nature that somehow is not evident to people in Western culture. So, um, you know, our ancestors at first contact, whenever that happened, um, whether it was 500 years ago or 300 years ago, um, were, were really actually horrified by the way that uh, Europeans who were arriving in the area or Americans who were arriving in the area or Canadians or whatever, um, behaved because it's like th this, this can't last. It, it, I think the easiest way that I can have it make sense to uh, people uh, in your culture is to say that it's as if uh, you, under, you have a, a large principal in the bank and you live off the interest and you understand you have to live off the interest. And if you do, it's going to take care of your family as long as there's anybody in your family, basically we saw people coming in from, uh, from Western traditions and immediately diving into the principle, digging it all out, taking it back home. And you look at that and you say, what, what are they thinking, right? How is, how, is, how is any sane person not comprehending that this won't work? Um, and of course, that's why colonization had to happen, is that the resources in Europe had been used up because they weren't being treated in a sustainable manner. So Western culture's modus operandi is if we run out, where can we go to get more? So, uh, you know, I have a friend that lives in Northern California whose husband wandered through a uh, 
a Zoom session that we were having, just having tea. And he was suddenly said, well, you know, we're running out of water here in the Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area. So the state is trying to figure out where else can we get water? So the, the answer is never, let's not use so much water. It's where can we go to get what we need? And now, of course, we've got people looking at the moon and Mars and asteroid mining asteroids. And of course, energetically speaking, this is a this is kind of like a, a we'll just say it's not a sustainable project, that the issue here isn't always finding a place to go to get more. It's comprehending that there is something about one's understanding of natural law and the way that all living things should behave if they intend to survive, that Western culture is missing. And the only difference between what's going on now in the Amazon rainforest basin and what went on uh, 250 years ago in say, the eastern part of North America is that 250 years ago, there were enough other places still left to go to get more stuff mm. that it didn't bother colonizers if they ran through whatever they, they were just, well, we'll just go farther. And now we're reaching the point where even people in Western culture are able to see that, wait a minute, there isn't, there isn't more. There, we're running out. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, anything that can help um, people in a culture that has somehow locked them out of this knowledge, if they can realize, if you can realize that there's this whole piece of wisdom about simply being alive on this planet that has been denied to you for whatever reason, um, then it means there's the opportunity for change. And um, as you mentioned, the, the part of the consequence of all of this uh, rampant, uh, you know, misuse of, of the planet um, is that, and the destruction of, not just misuse, but wanton destruction of it, is that it's having consequences on things like global temperatures, air temperatures, ocean temperatures, freshwater lake temperatures, river temperatures, all of those matter. And again, it's, it's a big enough impact, it, it suddenly is visible, even to people who would rather not see it. It's really visible. So um, I think one thing that is important for people to realize and to really understand as they're thinking about these things is to realize this is not a new problem. This problem has been going on for a very long time. What's new about it is how much of the planet it's impacting. That is what's making the difference. This problem has been going on for a really long time. You know, there used to be a lot of forests in the Middle East. They, they were gone. Um, there used to be a lot of forests, from what I understand, in parts of uh, uh, Scotland that are gone. There, there were a lot of forests in Spain um, that were taken to, uh, to build ships. So, you know, it's easy if you are in a culture whose way of operating is to say, if we run out, we'll go get more somewhere else. You've always got that next horizon. You, you don't, you're not staying behind to look at the mess you created, right? You can't learn. There's no way to learn. So here we have a moment in history that is a really great learning opportunity. It's an opportunity for change. Yeah. And it's kind of in the nick of time because unfortunately things had to get really bad before, before they could be noticed. Um, there had to be nowhere left to go um, to get more stuff and we're starting to hit that point. So um, I have hoped that it will actually be um, a moment of, um, of truth that provides an opportunity for learning that can change things. 
because yeah. the thing that has to change isn't actually the amount of methane in the atmosphere or how much carbon dioxide is the at that's not actually what needs to change what needs to change is human hearts and human minds mm. that's what has to change that can save things um when we have it yeah when we had that meeting in 2019 one group that came come from the santa marta uh, mountains in colombia and they're called the aruaco and they're part of a very old civilization the triona civilization and their young people uh, or certain members of their community who are identified by the elders who are called mamos as being ready are taken into caves in the mountains where they are taught to feel what they call the black lines the web of life that connects all the different species and beings and um they they learn this from the elders and they they learn to feel it and they learn to understand how they can care for these black lines and and ensure that they are you know strong and and, and thriving and then when they're about 18 or 19 uh, they're actually brought out into the world to witness the beauty of the creation that they've just been feeling and knowing in that way. And then they dedicate the whole of their lives to just maintaining the black lines. And when they came to London, we took them to Greenwich Park, which is where the zero meridian uh, is placed. And that zero meridian was created in order to facilitate the conquest by the British of the rest of the world. It's how they mapped out time and place. Um, from those meridians and the the Aruaco Mamos they did a, a ritual there and they said this is an epochal moment we are moving from one epoch to another and the epoch that we've just been in it's been the epoch of conquest the epoch of uh, uh, of acquisition and uh, accumulation uh, uh, and unnecessary storing and we want to shift now to a different epoch, an epoch of understanding, of communication, of coming together. And of course, that was before COVID and all the thoughtfulness that uh, for those who, who didn't have to suffer during that epidemic experienced um, has really, I think, uh, brought home to me just the, the foresight of, of the Arawako in, in understanding that what the earth is, is, is saying. And, and it was a very beautiful uh, ceremony that they conducted and one which, which really moved those who were present very profoundly. So, um, th and they have their, their system for healing earth and, and, and I was very impressed by the sophistication of it. So, I mean, this problem of, of greed, of accumulation, of constant wanting to, to have more the way that uh, modern society, and, and I think it's gone beyond the West now, it's not simply in Europe and, and you know, we find it now, it's been exported and it's very seductive, the convenience of roads, of cars, of, you know, of, of nice houses where you can sit comfortably and, uh, and not think about, you know, digging your food or planting your, your food or, or harvesting it, but just consuming it when you want through money. Has, has made it a very seductive uh, culture and, and it's spreading. I see people in China, I see people in Africa, I see people in Asia, all now following this convenience culture, this monoculture effectively that, that's spreading almost like an illness across the world. And, and I just wondered from your perspective, I mean, do you see uh, opportunities for transformation within that? Um, and, and if you do, how do you see them developing? So I think the first thing is, of course, that what you're talking about is the result of colonization. All the places where Western culture is rampant are it's because Western culture transplanted itself there. Um, I think the issue is actually way simpler than we tend to look at it as being. Mm -hmm. um, the culture that you interacted with, every, every indigenous culture has its own traditions for ceremony, for caring for the earth, for understanding it. But I, I would like to, um,
I would like to say that I think that sometimes when we speak with people from the dominant culture, we, um, we go to our strongest point to explain things. So, uh, you know, um, if I really want to explain who uh, we are as native people on this continent are to someone, I would want to introduce someone to, to one of the really particularly uh, deeply wonderful elders that I know, um, because that's the best opportunity for them to really get a strong sense of who we are. But the elder is not different from anybody else. And the elder doesn't have really different uh, kinds of gifts than anybody else. They're just uh, more adept. And they usually have a, a much more pure uh, value system behaviorally so they can stay calm if someone assaults them. They can respond thoughtfully rather than emotionally to things, things like that. So I think it's really important when we have visits with people from indigenous traditions to remember that the differences are very often ones of degree rather than of ability. And I'm saying this because I very much respect the the people that, that came there and that you were in contact with. But I also kind of suspect that there is not as sharp of a line as you might think there is between the, the people who were trained to feel these lines and the others. And the reason I say this is that around the world, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think they meet they, that they even meant to quite suggest that is, is what I'm saying. I think it's like me introducing you to the elder. Around the world, one of the most common features among indigenous cultures of many different kinds is that we are in very close communion with and communication with the natural world. Mm. Different people have different kinds of extra gifts with respect to that. But I think most of the indigenous people I know who still follow a traditional way of relating to the world, as opposed to say they've been completely acculturated. And unfortunately, a lot of us around the world have been because it's really hard to resist that, mm -hmm. especially if we would like to make a decent living or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't, I think I would have to really work to come up with someone I know in any indigenous tradition who is not able to feel the connections very clearly between themselves and the land, between themselves and the animals and the plants and the rivers and the wind and the sun and the stars and the spirits, because there's a lot of unseen uh, life in the world, and the ancestors, because time isn't actually linear, and our ancestors are still here, the uh, animals that are extinct are still here, um, they, they're not visible to the eye most of the time, but that doesn't mean they're not here. Um, and uh, it, but, but so there's this sort of, it's like, it's like most humans can speak, right? Most humans can sing. And yet there are some people who can be opera stars. They sing way better, but, it, but it's not because they're the only ones who can sing. Mm. And I think that's a really important thing because people in, in Western culture, because of this break with the natural world, they tend to see indigenous relationship with the natural world as being kind of mystic or mystified or different, something that's not available to everybody, right? That mm. you have to get a special training and you have to 
you know, go out and fast for a period of time and be on a mountain in the dark for, by yourself and get hit by lightning and, you know, um, when in fact, every human being is born with the capability, with the capacity of being able to communicate with the natural world because we're part of it. But, you know, a baby is born. I think I just read that, that there are like 800 different sounds that an infant can make that, that are in all these different languages that people speak. And what develops which ones of those the child learns to use is, is the language they're exposed to in their, in their home. But a child that's raised in an environment where nobody ever speaks to it, they don't even develop the speech centers of their brain properly. It's very hard for them to learn to talk. And we all know it's harder to learn a second language once you're over you know, 20 or 30 years old, it becomes really difficult, but you can do it. Yeah. So you've got this gradient you know, and then there are some people that they speak very well, but it's, you know, uh, it's hand me the wrench, please. Right. And they're really, really good with their hands that they're really gifted, but language, there are other people who might be really poetic, but you know, they're, they, if their car dies on the road, it's all over, right. They, they they're just no good with that. So we all have different gifts and within the range of the whole set that we all have as human beings, some of us are better at some things than others. What is different about the situations where we have where people learn, for instance, to sing the songs for a certain animal that we have relationship with so that we can care for them properly, but also so they come and offer themselves to us or to sing the songs for planting a certain kind of plant or whatever that might be. It isn't that they have a gift nobody else can have. It's that they've been given this extra bit um, mm -hmm. as a gift, as, a, as it's like a talent. And so one of the things you do with children is you, you recognize where their special talents are and you, and you train them accordingly to make best use of those talents. And in indigenous community, it's about understand, you know, in the natural world, this is true. It's why in ecology, people talk about food webs and stuff. There is this web of life that humans are part of. So that means that we have a responsibility. We have a role to play. If, if, if the honeybees don't pollinate flowers, a lot of things go wrong, right? Because that's their job. That's what they do. And they get something in return for it. They get the pollen, they get the nectar, they, they go back, they make their stuff that they have in their hive. It's a two way street, mm. but the same is true for humans. So we also have roles to fulfill in the web of, of all that is. And that's a little, we raise our children accordingly. So we don't, you know, in Western schools, we say, well, this person is good at math. You know, I think he could be an accountant or this person is good at math. I think she could, you know, uh, teach algebra. Um, it's, it's kind of in the head. It's like, what can they do that's good to make, that's a good fit to make money that they're good at. Mm -hmm. We tend to look at everything within that web of life and just say, what gifts was this person given that help them to uphold their piece of it so that it all works right for the community. And it's that community where you live. It's all the animals, the plants, the waters, the winds, everything, soil, and, and of course the people. So coming back then to the people that you met um, with, their, with their beautiful training for those who have um, particular skills and understanding how to care for these lines. There, there are um, people in other traditions that are aware of these lines as well. And they, there's all kinds of things happening with them right now, people trying to, to, to help them. But, um, but I wanna be sure it doesn't get put way over here as this special different thing yeah. that, that is, so, yeah. I don't wanna mystify it because you have 
that potential too. And, uh, you know, everybody in, in listening to this, that's part of your birthright, actually. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, yes, you're no longer four years old. So it's harder to get that language back. It's harder to certainly going to be hard to learn how to be fluent in it. And what it's going to take is time and a lot of mentoring in situations where you're on living land that can take part in the education. And that's really becoming difficult because urban areas kind of, they, they kind of, you know, if, if you've ever been in a really big city on a day that everything is going nuts and there's car alarms and ambulances and people playing loud music in the street and you get to that point that you're like I can't that there's too much hitting you there's overstimulation right you just go well, stop I have to go find a quiet dark place and that's kind of how the land seems to feel in in heavy urban areas mm -hmm. so um, it's it's really hard if that's where you are to find a place where you can get that contact. It's not impossible, but the other trick is you need you need the equivalent of the adults who help the child learn how to speak. You need somebody who's there who can provide feedback and this sort of thing. So the the good news is this is a skill that people in Western culture can learn. And once you do, you too will understand sustainability as a natural law because it's right there. It's all around you. And then it's easy to change how you live. You don't have to like, you know, shut it down from the top and say, stop being greedy. Don't do this because that, that really feels awful, right? That just, that just feels dreadful. If, if you learn to hear and see and you're aware of it, you go, oh, and, and, and right away you understand, oh, I need to do this differently, right? So that's the good news. The bad news is it's going to take a while. It's going to take longer than we have for enough people to accomplish this to hit a tipping point that can have an impact. Mm. So... The thing that has to happen before we get there, I mean, there's several things. One thing that has to happen is people in Western culture need to understand there's another way, there's another reality that exists. And it's, it's, it's like the reality that you're in is about this wide because you've cut off all of these ways that you can access that information. It's really big. So to understand that these possibilities exist and begin to try to read indigenous authors, not, not Western authors writing about indigenous people, but reading indigenous authors. And that includes novelists and poets, as well as people like Vine Deloria, who is excellent. Um, but to begin to kind of open up to the possibilities of this, because this is, that flowering has to happen. And the second thing is to try to calm down enough to get some abatement of the panic that's beginning to rise in people. And, and, and that's because the panic is leading people to do even more damage. Mm. Um, and we can, we can talk about that in a minute if you wish. And the third thing to do is when it comes to caring for the earth is really to let indigenous people lead for a little while in this interim space, because we're, in a, we're, we're, we're really in a situation that's quite serious. And unfortunately, the panic that people in Western culture are beginning to feel because you don't realize this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years it seems like but when i was a kid it wasn't like this it's all brand new so there's this panic um what it's causing people to do is more of what they've already done that got us into this to begin with yeah. so 
people's response is we have to fix it. Here's how we're going to fix it. We're going to put up these levees. We're going to put up these walls, sea walls. We're going to scrub out the methane. We're going to, and it's like, stop, 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 stop. So it's kind of like you can imagine that you're in a canoe. I hope people have canoed. Maybe not. But if, you know, a canoe is a wonderful, wonderful craft. It's lightweight. You know, you can literally spin it in this, around the center you're sitting in. But if you stand up in a canoe, it go, you go over. You know, if you have a lot of people in a canoe and you have a couple of people that get scared, let's see, they see a turtle in the water and they get scared and they both stand up and they start jumping around. Everybody's going in the drink. Yeah. So the way indigenous people feel about it right now is the world is a canoe and all the humans are in it and only three to four percent five percent of those people are indigenous people and what we're seeing is that people in western culture are getting scared they're getting excited they've suddenly seen the alligator in the water that we've been dealing with for you know 400 years or whatever and they're going oh my gosh oh my God, oh my God. and they're jumping up and down in the canoe and we're going sit sit please sit yeah sit down sit down because yes, it, it is dangerous. Yes, the alligator could tip us over. Yes, this is, this is not safe, but you're jumping around is going to make it way worse. <laughs> and you're gonna dump us in the water too. And we've been working really hard not to get dumped all these years because we have been carrying the knowledge that's required to get out of this. It's been passed down for generations because our ancestors saw what was going to happen. If, if you if you are connected to the natural world, all you have to do is look at how Western culture lives and it's it, it it's a no brainer. It's like there's no way it can end any other way except a, a, a disaster. So we we knew we needed to keep this knowledge, this this way of really this connection to the natural world and keep it alive and we have preserved it all these generations at great cost to ourselves um, because the advantage of acculturating and losing all that knowledge is you have a nice big house with a nice big yard and two cars and everything you need, right? To keep that knowledge, you have to pay a price, which is you really can't fit in the same way to Western culture. And so you're not as successful financially in that regard you don't you don't have those things and we also of course at the same time don't have the uh plenty that we used to live with because the people that acculturated it i don't mean to throw any shadows at anybody here but they took it from us which is why they have the money to pay people for cars and houses is they they took our timber trees they call it our timber we call it our trees it's our forest they mm. they they took our rocks they took our water they took our animals and so um so if you live outside of western culture in order to preserve that knowledge in order to to uh to keep it safe as the sort of secret weapon that can come back someday to give people a chance to survive um it means that you have to live in that impoverished landscape that remains um, and we do our best to allow it to still exist and to nurture it which is why biodiversity is as high as it is you know um yeah. we don't we don't decide that this animal is no good so we need to get rid of it or <laughs> you know it, it's part of what's there um so yeah, well, the, I mean, sorry. No, go ahead. I'm just, I was thinking, how did I get here? And did I think I went, I don't think I came full circle. I'm, I think I lost my trail there. <laughs> no, no, but the trail's strong. We're going to keep following it. Okay. Um, no, well, so you've said some really powerful and very important things, of course. And that separation, I think, is, is really at the heart from the point of view of people like me, these uh, Western people. Um, that we're, we're, we are desperately, or many of us, and probably people who are listening to this, are 
seeking to reconnect and they have various strategies for the, that reconnection. Um, and I just wondered, I mean, you've mentioned some of the uh, ways that uh, indigenous people do that, but I wondered if you can offer some suggestions of how Western people might think about creating contexts where that connection can start to happen again. And, and also, you mentioned the importance of being led by indigenous people. And, and I think this is a really important point. And perhaps you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by being led by indigenous people. I think in some ways, the two points you've raised overlap um, mm. in terms of, uh, right now indigenous people are saying a lot because we're like, boy, if they don't hear us now, it's over. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like, that. <laughs> there's a saying this is the time that they were that they did this for so uh all uh, every group i know the elders have <laughs> i'm talking about in this country people i know mm. um, the um the elders carry knowledge that was given to them that was put into the the lineage uh, knowledge lineage by the most spiritually with it people that were alive at the time of first contact who i mean we just couldn't believe that there were people who lived this way yeah. right? i mean it's just it's just astonishing if you live in the natural world yeah. um, and so uh one of the one of the biggest emotional reactions that indigenous people had was um just feeling incredulous, you know, first that that people would live this way. And then second, that somehow they could get away with it. And, mm -hmm. you know, just say, yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna take this land, and we're gonna take all the trees off and and like, nothing happened to them, right? Yeah. Um, because the earth has been to this point, very forgiving and tolerant. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to be the same way. Uh, because that's our, that's our role model that's 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 our that's our boss <laughs> uh that's our mother that yeah. that's who we listen to right so um but those those um spiritually powerful people back then you know they did a lot of work um spiritual work that that they were gifted at doing to say you know what's going on here and what's going to happen and the spirits told them, so yeah, this is going to go exactly where you think it's going to go. And you need to be prepared for that. And you need to, to um, preserve the essence of your, of your ways of knowing, of your knowledge, and pass, make sure it's passed down no matter what. And you know the certain key stories, don't lose these. And then they gave markers. You're going to know you're getting to there because of this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And when you see these things, it's time to bring it out, right? Mm -hmm. It's time to bring it out. Because until that time, it's kind of like a survival game for us. You know, people in Western culture talk a lot about the apocalypse. We already went through the apocalypse. Exactly. And, I, and I'm not exaggerating, we did. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we, we've been in a survival game, living in a post-apocalyptic landscape, quite literally. Yeah. And so the idea was, you know, that that's our concern. And so now what's going on, and there's a UN recording that's, uh, that's, that's preserved at uh, YouTube of uh, Oren Lyons, um, even listing some of the ones that, uh, that his people um, held and how many of them are coming. So what's happening is a, a combination of things. Uh, one is that you know, all of our people are going, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, well, we're there. It's time, right? We've got to speak up. This is the this is the time that they left this for. And then there are people having dreams and all this. I mean, there's a lot of of the land is moving and the ancestors and the spirits are moving and our people and saying, now, 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 speak up, speak up, speak up, and and try and and do something. And so um so there are a lot of indigenous people who are speaking there are a lot of indigenous people who are writing 
there are a lot of indigenous people putting up all kinds of resources online um, and uh, people need to avail themselves of these materials and again it's really important to make sure it's not somebody writing about indigenous people so you know but if you go on youtube and you look up Oren lions um you can learn a lot um and uh and it's information that he intended to be available to people of the dominant culture that's why he was speaking about it at the un um the thing that has distressed many of the indigenous people I know is that so far it hasn't caused any change in activity. So there's been a lot of people saying, yes, we'd like to hear what you have to say. And yes, we'd like to read what you wrote. And then we're going to go and talk about it some more. And then we're going to have another meeting and we're going to talk about it some more and then we're going to have another meeting and talk about it some more and um uh that that's concerning because we're running out of time at the same time we're not looking for there to be action that involves building seawalls or uh covering up big parts of tunisia with solar panels and running giant electrical things. What we're concerned about is things like if you look at the development of electric cars, the original electric cars were kind of like golf carts, right? They yeah. didn't use very much electricity. They didn't need big batteries, lithium powered batteries, any of that. And, you know, if you look at electric cars now, what they talk about, it can go 90 miles an hour. It can go 120 miles an hour. You can haul all this stuff. You can do so. There's this, there's this idea that somehow going from a big, fast, flashy, prestige gas powered car to a big, fast, flashy electrical powered car that now requires that you mine lithium and other copper and all this stuff that goes into making it and that you pave solar panels all over the world, which we know there have been papers published in science that they change the climate. Hello, all right, that somehow this is a solution. It's not, it's simply moving from here to here in the same place, right? It, it's not changing anything. It's just changing from one kind of really mindless consumption that emphasizes convenience and speed to another kind of mindless consumption that emphasizes convenience and speed. So the kind of thing we'd like to see people start thinking about is stuff like, is my, the speed with which I can go from here to there, is that really worth changing the climate in the Sahara Desert in such a way that it's going to impact all of Asia at the very least? Or might it be a better idea for me to realize I need to slow down the speed with which I live? Mm. It's a really hard thing for Western culture because it's do, 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 right? It's built on doing. Mm. And um, is flying in a jet to this vacation location, is that really something I want to do if it means that there are these other consequences? So it's not about giving up everything, but it's about beginning to realize that the behaviors that we need to change are not, we think probably coincidentally, ones that we dipped our toes into at the beginning of the pandemic, which is slow down. Mm. Don't travel so far so fast every day. Be a little bit more thoughtful. Think a little bit more carefully about what you bring into your home and how much of it. And 
I think we're going to see as the price of fuel goes up, we'll be thinking things like, do all the rooms in my home need to be this temperature? Or can it be this one or these two for right now? And then I'll switch it when night comes or whatever it might be. I think these are individual decisions. So I wouldn't begin to know what would be appropriate for somebody. But you know, we have a lot of buildings that their windows don't even open anymore. I mean, they never did. They're, they were designed so the windows don't open. The only way to open them is to throw a, a, a desk through. Them. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we've got, what I'm suggesting is that um, as you read what indigenous people are saying, and as you listen to what they're saying, um, it's out there all over the place if you look. And um, our website has some beginnings of stuff on it. Excuse me, but I mean, there's just so much that the thing to think about is to, is to think about two things. One is slowing down ourselves, mm. thinking about just pulling back a little. You know, if you think about that, spending the principal instead of the interest, right? The first thing you do is you go, let me slow down and kind of let everything settle and see how much money is left, right? And did I really need to get, you know, you just, you're not changing your patterns yet. You're just kind of coasting to kind of a slower speed of consumption mm. to give some time to look at what's going on because there's like all this dust in the air, right? You can't even see what's, what's happening. It's so crazy. And then, uh, I think there are a lot of indigenous people who have some good ideas, who have good ideas. And um, there, are, there are projects that they want to carry out that can be funded. Um, for example, we're uh, one of many groups setting up uh, a program to give small grants of, you know, $500, $1,000 or whatever to um, people who are uh, looking at uh, the things that the land is telling them that it needs to have done to help it out right now. Um, for instance, uh, I, I know a, a, a professor um, of Native Studies, who's a Native person that had uh, two young people, uh, I, I, I'm thinking they were like around 18, who came to this professor, came to them and said, uh, we've both been given dreams separately that there's this invasive plant in this particular forest and the forest would like us to come and remove it because it's creating problems. Mm. And um, they were trying to get gas money to get to, the, to that forest to do that work. So um, this is the kind of thing that's going on. And there are groups now coming together to provide support to these people because the kind of things that we actually do on the ground are very localized. They're very specific. And they're things the land has asked us to do. And this is really, really an important distinction. This is why indigenous people are saying, please let us lead for a while while you go through your coasting, cooling down process of waiting and seeing what's going on is that um, indigenous people, we are ourselves led by the land. That's, that's what we're listening to when we do a thing. So, you know, I, my, my advanced degrees are in ecology and evolutionary biology. And, um, you know, I know some wildfire ecologists and things like that. And I can go into a forest with them and, and we can be together and, and they can say, look at this 
especially if they've just heard me talk about those two young people who said that there was an invasive plant. They look around, they go, oh, that's an invasive plant. We need to remove that. Let's get people up and take care of it. And, and, and they know that I'm a Choctaw woman. They don't, they're, they're not uncomfortable about that. They know that I say that I hear the land and they're not uncomfortable about that. But if at that moment I say, you know, I think we need to do ceremony and find out what the land here really wants because it might not, that might not be a problem. There are actually situations in which a so-called invasive plant, what Western culture labels that as, is, is actually being very helpful to a forest that's in, these forests are in trouble. They're, they're not the original forest. So, you know, a, a nurse who comes into your home is an invasive person, but if you're sick, she's not, or he's not, right? They're, they're yeah. there for a reason. So if I say, let's, let's do ceremony and first, let's not just jump in and do this. Let's see what this land needs. They're like, what if somebody found out I did that, right? It, it's got, and this is how Western culture has separated itself from nature, right there. It's in what ways of knowing are officially approved. And that's primarily left, left, left brain, right? It's intellect, it's reasoning, it's logic, it's deduction. That, that's all acknowledged as a valid way of knowing. It's what you get tested on, on standardized tests. Knowing through the heart, through emotion, knowing through dream, knowing through vision, knowing through proprioceptive stuff, right? You can talk to somebody who plays a, a sport and they say, oh, I don't think about it. I just, I reach up and I know, I, I know where it is to grab it, right? They get mm -hmm. it because their body knows. That's a kind of knowledge and believe it or not on the land, that's a kind of knowledge that does, you do get knowledge that way from a forest or from a river. That's how you keep from turning your canoe over. In fact, is the river's talking to you through that paddle and through the sound of the water on the bottom of the canoe, right? And it's proprioceptive, it's in your body. Mm. So there's all these other ways of knowing art, dance, music, story is a huge one. Western culture says nobody learns through story. If I go to a science meeting and I say, I'm going to tell you a story, they all go, oh, no, here she goes again. She's going to do that. And, and it's like, OK, if story isn't important to Western culture, tell me, how is Hollywood so powerful and wealthy? Right. Mm -hmm. We simply aren't paying attention as a culture to the stories that we're telling. And that's that's really difficult. But at any rate. Because there are all kinds of stories. Some stories are real stories told by the land, and some stories are made up in people's heads, and they've got the person's own story, which is pathological because they've been abused or whatever, wrapped into it. And it's very, it's very difficult. But at any rate, you've got all these ways of knowing, and Western culture has only this little, and the way that it restricts that, the way it enforces that restriction is with the threat of insanity. Hmm. So if you listen to dreams, if you say, I was just thinking this when that metal lark landed right there and it walked up and down, and I think it's telling me something, showing me something. Or if you say, you know, anything like that, that what people say is, oh, I think you're crazy, right? In Europe, for a long time, women who practiced indigenous knowledge were burned at the stake as witches. I think this is, this is part of what's kind of written into Western culture is this fear of the natural world, this discomfort with the natural world as a threatening thing to human beings. And so there's this, there's this fear of it and it, it all kind of works together. So, you know, I see it working as I do with, with Western scientists, that there's, there's a sense that if you listen to this stuff, if you, if you actually admit you hear it, you're crazy. Um, and that, um, that if you dig down underneath that, that judgment of insanity, what's at the bottom of it is fear. Mm -hmm. It's a fear of the natural world. And that's what's making this panic everybody is experiencing so dangerous is that Western culture is already afraid of the natural world. So the whole, you know, 
climate change is very serious, but the fear of climate change is very dangerous. Right. Because, you know, uh, river levees that have pretty much made New Orleans today's numbers numbered. I mean, there's nothing that can be done really to save it at this point. Um, and the forest timbering that we've done, our, our lumbering and grazing practices, you know, the forests have got to do a lot to get healthy again. They, they just, they've got to start over. They can't, they can't get from where they are now to where they need to be. Uh, you know, the, these changes came about because of Western culture's fear of, I'm going to be cold, I'm going to be hungry, I'm going to be impoverished, the, you know, the earth is, is against me, nature is against me, the wolf is at the door, the, you know, all the bad guys are the wolves and the bears and, right, um, all the fairy tales. Um, so, uh, Well, I, I think, you know, what you've been sharing, you know, is, is really sums up that dislocation that we began with it. It really explains the heart of it and the, the advice to slow down, to to engage with listening to the land and and serving the land, actually, I think is, is, is a very useful way of conceiving that. You know, how can you serve the land? How can you serve the land that you dwell on? We had a visit from Nimonte Ninquino, who's an Ecuadorian Warani, who very successfully resisted oil exploitation in her land. And she said, you know, the land doesn't need, the earth doesn't need you to save her. She needs you to respect her. And, and I thought there's so much deep truth in that. And, and I think what you've been sharing with us is a pathway to building that respect again in our own cultures. And so thank you very much, Dawn, for all that you've shared with us. I will say in closing, that's why I wanted to title this Healing Earth, is that it's the word healing here is not a verb. It's not about humans healing Earth. Mm. The Earth is healing. Us. The Earth heals itself and the Earth heals us. Mm. And the Earth can heal Western culture, the violence and all these things, child abuse. These are all ills that come when the land itself is ill. Mm. And if, if people in Western culture can calm down and stop trying to fix things, yeah. the earth can actually heal itself and then it can heal us. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Dawn. That was a beautiful sharing. I uh, really appreciate every time we speak. It's such a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you so much to the both of you for being here today. I'm just having a look at the chat and there's some really, really wonderful comments of thanks from everyone that's joined us today. Thank you everyone that tuned in wherever you are in the world. If you're here in the UK and it's a very hot Friday, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen. And thank you again, Dawn and Jerome, for this wonderful conversation.